Chris Bennett is my guest today, author of many books, including the latest one titled Liber 420, Cannabis, Magical Herbs and the Occult. I wish we had more time to talk, but the conversation went only for an hour. So we touched upon a few interesting topics, such as alchemy, Holy Grail, Soma, Sufism, which I think will be interesting for anyone who looked into it in order to find answers. I hope you enjoy our conversation and give us a like. All right, Chris Bennett is my guest today. Glad to have you here. Thank you for coming, Chris. Well, thanks for having me. My pleasure. All right, I, I'm very excited to actually. I was very excited to meet you because uh, you write about things that that you know I was curious about since very early age. Uh, we go back to my late teens when I was smoking cannabis and reading books on occultism, you know, and trying to figure out uh, where. Where do I dig? Where where do I dig to find the Holy Grail? You know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's dear to my heart what you write about this. It, it's it's like nice. kind of a, my uh, life path too. So it's amazing that we can talk about things, and I will just ask you things that you know I'm just interested myself, and then we just have a conversation. You know, build up on top of that. Okay. Sounds so, good. I just want to introduce you a, a bit more. So Chris Bennett wrote uh, four books so far and his latest book, which called Liber 420, that's the book we will be talking about mostly here. And then of course the conversation can go to different places, but that's, that would be kind of a base. And that's the book that I highly recommend to anyone who is curious about medieval magic, alchemy, and uh, you know occultism and everything that was connected to it and and you know uh, if you're interested to go into the roots of it and and see how things connected before the two you know and uh, it goes to the gnosticism and other interesting topics so it's a massive book it's like 800 pages it's a massive research so i can appreciate it from the perspective of you know an author as a, myself an author, I can appreciate how much effort went to this book. So let's just start from um, just maybe introduce yourself and how you got to writing and what's your life path? Yeah, well, um, a, a little over 30 years ago, I had a very powerful religious experience uh, under cannabis and I couldn't decide if I had just had a, like a delusionary experience or if there was something to it. I started like combing the uh, record for accounts of people uh, um, having spiritual experiences under cannabis and, and uh, green gold, the tree life, marijuana, and magic and religion. And then I just kept expanding on that area of research and all my books are really been about the basically the same thing, uh, um, the role of cannabis in magic and religion. And it's a fascinating history. And, you know, the, the really nice thing about studying cannabis in this respect, as opposed to um, some of the other entheogenic substances, is there's, there's, there's just so much historical data uh, on cannabis. You know, it appears the name is, you know, uh, is very aged. You know, cannabis is a Latin term and uh, um, has been and uh, um, we also know its name in various other languages is well established and then there's a lot of archaeological evidence right as opposed to things like you know mushrooms where people will say oh well this tree looks like a mushroom and this must indicate secret mushroom used by Christians or Buddhists or somebody wherever the image comes from and it's pretty speculative right I, I like the uh, uh, ability to not speculate so much when it comes to cannabis. Of course, I speculate here and there, but I try to address speculation as speculation and fact is fact. And the wealth of facts 
with in regards to cannabis, make it clear that it played a, a paramount role in religions like Taoism, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Zoroastrianism, and many other uh, uh, religions. And, it, and it's also a fact that it was used by alchemists and uh, medieval magicians. Uh, um, and that's just the historical fact. So I, I, I like that about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Solid. It's a solid research, something you can refer. So maybe, maybe we can start from a history of alchemy and, and just yep. go around that. And uh, the Holy Grail, the, the legend of the Holy Grail and everything around it, where it started, what, what, from your research, what were the roots? Where did it start? Well, I, I think, you know, when we start talking about alchemy, you know, we, I think, you know, alchemy could be, you could interpret alchemy to go way, way, way back. But I think the real uh, uh, place where alchemy started would be with a figure like Zosimos in the uh, fourth century AD. And Zosimos was uh, uh, trying to take the group initiations that were in Gnosticism and uh, other mystery schools and make them a singularly a uh, singular form of initiation, a self initiation, uh, and this is kind of where alchemy kind of comes in. And he was very into uh, uh, plant uh, extracts, like uh, tinctures and things like that. He talked a lot about that, uh, a technique he claimed to have picked up from uh, Mary the Jewess. That one of the first alchemists was a female, Mary the Jewess. And uh, uh, writing in the fourth century A.D., <coughs> he referred specifically to how the Egyptians were using cannabis uh, mixed into wine or uh, 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 beer along with things like uh, uh, Darnell, another psychoactive plant uh, for magical purposes. So this establishes its role fairly early in these sorts of traditions, right? And then um, when we go to about the 12th, 13th century, um, in, in, uh, 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 Drinks known as tinctures known as uh, uh, arcanums, which means kind of secret elixir, or quintessences, which means fifth essence. And the the the, the fifth essence, you know, there's like the body, the the, the salt, the all all the different elements, right? Uh, um, the fifth essence was like the soul, and, and they believe that when you took a plant and you put it into alcohol, it extracted the soul of the plant, the quintessence, the fifth essence. And if you, you know, you kept doing it into this tincture, you could increase the potency of that plant by 20, 30 times, right? And this is kind of one of the earliest forms of medicine, these potent uh, 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 tinctures uh, uh, known as quintessences, paracelsus, that he prescribed for epilepsy. We know today that epilepsy is very treatable by cannabis. And his own um, philosopher Stone was probably a solidified of his quintessence of opium that he referred to as laudanum and uh, just let the alcohol extract out and that would form into solid balls. He was said to carry around a uh, mouse side turds in the pummel of his sword um, in order to, uh, and that would be his philosopher Stone, right? So this is pretty early on in alchemy. And in regards to arcanums and uh, quintessences, we find references to cannabis in these preparations. They used other plants too. You can make a quintessence of mandrake. You can make a quintessence of cannabis. You, all sorts of varieties of plants, right? Um, uh, we find references to these quintessences of uh, with references to cannabis in the Lullian Corpus, which is one of the most, most famous uh, 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 groups of texts uh, regarding alchemy uh, in the works of Cardano, uh, Avicenna, the, uh, the Islamic uh, uh, alchemist. He refers to cannabis tinctures or cannabis infused wine. Um, and uh, Rabelais, <coughs> a uh, 16th century uh, alchemist who uh, wrote the famous book Gargantua and Pantagruel and incorporated cannabis in there, um, as well as others, you know. So it was, it was very well known in, in alchemy. Now, you also mentioned the Holy Grail, you know, and this is largely um, based on the, the 12th century. 13th century poems and stuff uh, that we know about is where the, the story started emerging. Uh, and often the Knights Templar are mentioned in reference to uh, the Holy Grail as being the carriers of the Grail. And it's interesting because the Templar is a very 
controversial uh, group of warrior monks in the 12th to 13th, 14th century, um, who were eventually shut down and uh, uh, by the church and persecuted for, for her heresy. Um, we know that uh, the Templars did in fact have uh, 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 Sabians, uh, Arab, Arab people, growing cannabis for them in Spain. And Spain's not a climate where you would uh, grow industrial hemp. And Arabs are not specialized in growing industrial hemp. They know about resin cannabis. This is an area where resin cannabis would have been growing. As well, in the raids of the Templar compounds, both in France and in England, there's large records of everything that was seized from the compound. And large amounts of cannabis were seized from both compounds. It's just lit, listed as raw cannabis. So it was probably cannabis flowers or something like that, because things like rope and cloth were, were designated as such. And this is just designated as cannabis. Um, so it's likely that the, 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 the Templars may have picked up some sort of uh, uh, mystic use or alchemical use of cannabis. So they were familiar by this time with the, the workings of Avicenna. They had contact with groups like the Hashishin, uh, a group of uh, Islamic heretics that uh, uh, were reputed to use cannabis in their own initiations and possibly influenced by earlier Gnostic influences. So uh, I would say that's kind of how it comes into the whole grail mythology. The, the term grail itself is related to an Indo-European term, grahas. And the grahas was the cup that held Soma. And when you really go back into the origins of the grail myth, you start to find connections a, a lot in Persian mythology. A lot of it's uh, 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 um, parcel Supposedly even thought to have elements of Persia in the name, you know, and other other terms in the in, in the Grail mythology, and this brings us into uh, the cannabis infused wines used by Zoroastrians, written about in Zoroastrians' texts, and the cup of Jepetarath, which was like a, a cup which you looked into and saw visions, and likely the what you drank from it helped to see the visions, and then you stared into the the bleakness of the cup, and you would see a vision in there. And this is all related to uh, the development of the Grail mythos, right? So there's some pretty strong connections uh, uh, um, there that I go over in, in my work regarding that. What do you think was in the Sufis wine? Was it metaphorical? Was it something infused in it or just literally wine or it was just like spiritual wine as, uh, you know, as people think? Well, absolutely, we know that Sufis, in some cases, did mix cannabis into wine. There's actual historical records to Sufis hashish and mixing their hashish in wine. A lot of Sufis, like there's a lot of poetry, there's a book um, called, uh, I got it here somewhere, but I don't know. The Herb versus uh, Medieval Muslim Society, and it's about uh, hashish and medieval Muslim society. And it's a collection of, you know, poems from both sides. A lot of poems, uh, some Sufis are praising wine and condemning hashish and other groups of Sufis are praising hashish and condemning wine. And then there's some that are mixing both together, right? Uh, the, the mixing of cannabis into wine is very ancient. We have archeological evidence of cannabis infused wines from France from 2000 years ago, from Pompeii, uh, about 2,100 years ago, right? Um, and, um, uh, Hassan I Sabah was he was uh, friends with the famous poet. I'm just trying to think of this Islamic uh, 11th, 12th century poet's name, Omar Khayyam. And uh, Omar Khayyam, um, you know, and it's hard to say which ones are legit and which ones were just by authors using his name. But in, in some of the poems attributed to Omar Khayyam, there's definitely references to hashish and wine and indications of, of their mixture. Uh, and that would strengthen uh, uh, um, that connection for the, the hashishin, if, if those were indeed poems written by Omar Khayyam. Um, but uh, yeah, definitely, uh, and that's where a lot of the spiritual wine po poetry comes from, is from the poems of Omar Khayyam, right? So. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to say because there are these references to hashish, and I go over uh, some of these poems. They're, uh, they're not in the more famous Fitzgerald translations, but they're in some of the other translations of Omar Khayyam poems by other uh, translators who collect poems. Um, and uh, 
uh, that's where the whole spiritual wine tradition comes in. So we do know in that same tradition, there is references to, to hashish infused wines. So why do you think Fitzgerald omitted hemp from uh, poetry of Chaim? I'm sorry? Why do you think Fitzgerald has omitted the... Oh, record? I don't even know that he would have been aware. There's like thousands of these poems, mm -hmm. right? It might not have been uh, um, anything intentional. You know, he probably collected, oh, I like this poem, I like that poem, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, it's not like... Uh, 19th century writers were trying to hide cannabis in Islam. There was like so much written about uh, cannabis in this time period. It's kind of like a, a renaissance for Europe with cannabis when they come in the 19th century after Napoleon's uh, escapades. Uh, cannabis starts coming really back into Europe. There's kind of like a period there where it's pretty, pretty unknown almost. But uh, in that same period, there's just a wealth of, uh, of material coming out of the east and there's lots of writing about people uh experimenting in the middle east and accounts of, of their experience mm, that's very interesting because you know omar khayyam was the first sufi to whom i was introduced in my teens you know I was about 70 years old <laughs> when i was reading khayyam and It, it really touched my heart. This is where things probably started for me. You know, it was cannabis and Omar Khayyam. Later, I already read Rumi and, oh, and others, but Omar Khayyam was, you know, the depth. It was just all there. It was profound understanding of mystery that nobody can name, you know, not even them too, but they pointed out to it, you know, and they basically guiding you through it telling you how to live your life and i really absolutely i i was like i was guided by this for years of my search you know still now i'm i like to read kayam in ceremonies you know but you know it was very important question for you me know, it, it was a very important question for me all these years asking myself was it something in this wine because my feeling was yeah. that it wasn't just a wine they were doing something there there was some kind of plant either mixed in it like literally or it was a code name for something you know it's just yeah. because obviously you know and i write in one of my books i write about this like you know i've drunk wine you know and i know many people who drank wine and uh, not much wisdoms come out of it you know you just get drunk and you know, go to sleep you know so there was something there that you can feel you can sense that these people were onto something they were ingesting some kind of psychoactive plant that that was hidden in the words you know so if, if i would see the reference which was you know saying like okay these people was uh, were uh, you know infusing cannabis that would make it easier to go through this you know and in the same way you know we go back to india now and to soma and soma is the same thing it was the actual drink it's not just a myth it's not just a song it's not just a hymn you know and those cups were full of medicine to get to these higher realizations That was clear to me when I was in my teens, but I didn't know what was there, you know? So what is, let's move to India now and let's talk about Soma. What do you think from your research? What was Soma and what's the roots of it? You know, this has been a, a major debate for centuries uh, amongst religious scholars and uh, prominently the ideas put forth by the banker and mycologist, R. Gordon Wasson, that Soma was a fly agaric mushroom have predominated the field in the last few decades. My view is very different from Wasson's, and I, uh, um, I go over Wasson's theory in my book on Soma and take it apart and show, like, Soma was a plant, a sacred drink, a god, and the moon in the sky. And as it was, this moon in the sky was seen as a celestial cup of Soma that the gods drank from, and as it waned, the gods were drinking Soma. And as it refilled, the gods were refilling the cup. And a lot of the Soma rituals were connected to the moon. Because 
to this Relay, uh, relied largely on references to Soma as the moon and th was using these moon descriptions to try and try it, tie it in with a round uh, uh, Amanita muscaria cap, right? And he actually left out the 10th mandala of the Rig Veda. The 10th mandala of the Rig Veda has the most descriptive accounts of Soma, the plant, in it. And it refers to it as a, a green and purple tree. It describes it uh, being processed by smashing it with stones and uh, uh, much like how you grind cannabis in India to make the drink bomb and smashing it with stones and the, the, the faces of the stones turning green from smashing it. So they're clearly talking about a plant, branches are mentioned as well. Likewise, as he with Heoma, the counterpart of Seoma in the, the Avesta literature in the, the Vedic and the Avestan literature, Avesta is from Persia, and this is, was the Mazdan religion that led to Zoroastrianism. In India, we have the Vedic religion, uh, uh, the Rig Veda, where the Soma is mentioned, and this led to Hinduism in India. But these, both these religions were thought to start from some earlier Indo-European source. And because of they have the, they're both written in Indo-European languages. And Indo-European languages is also the mother tongue for most of our European languages as well, right? And so there's a lot of commonalities in root words for all these languages, right? Cannabis is, is in there with all this as well, right? And we know that Indo-European culture has been using cannabis ritually for as far back as 5,500 years ago from Ukraine and Romania, they found uh, sensors, uh, ceramic bowls that were, you know, uh, cannabis was burnt in for funerary rituals. And this was practiced by Indo-European culture for thousands of years. Later on around 500 BC, we find the Scythians using the same tech cannabis from, and uh, um, the fumes uh, 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 um, uh, inhale inside a tent. Similarly, we find this with an Indo-European group that was in central China from about 2000 to 400 BC, uh, uh, the Gushi or Jushi, a Tocharian speaking people. They were similarly growing cannabis and burning it in, in rituals. And um, so there's a long history of Indo-European use. And this goes back to a time period before the uh, Avesta and the Vedic writers split off from their Indo-European ancestors and went in their different directions and started creating their own uh, uh, religious beliefs around them. Um, so my view is that uh, it is based a lot of like recent archaeology. And, uh, and in China, as I mentioned, they found these Indo-European groups that were using cannabis and cultivating cannabis. And there's a recent paper saying that uh, psychoactive cannabis actually originated in the same region uh, around 4,000 uh, years ago, 5,000 years ago, breaking off from the more fibrous quality cannabis and being specifically grown for its psychoactive properties, right? And these uh, people here, we know that they were in, in contact with groups like the Scythians. And the Scythians in this region, one of the names for them was the Heoma Varga. That means Heoma gatherers. And Heoma, as I mentioned, is the Persian counterpart of, of Soma. <clears throat> and um, the Scythians that gathered Heoma, they, it was said of them that they burnt and drank Heoma. And we have recovered from Scythian sites golden vessels that were used for drinking a preparation of cannabis and opium. And we know that these Chinese Indo-Europeans uh, uh, um, were in contact through the Scythian trade routes with another region called the Bactria Margiana Archaeological Complex. And this is in Afghanistan. And in this region in the 90s, a Russian archaeologist, Victor Serianati, um, <coughs> sorry, it's been, we, we have, have huge, huge fires out here, so there's a lot of smoke in the air. He um, claimed to have found three temple sites in the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex that he said were dedicated to the preparation of him, dedicated to the sacred beverage, his preparation. And he found evidence, he said, of ephedra, cannabis, and in some cases, uh, uh, poppy. 
Uh, um, now, they also found ephedra with these same um, 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 uh, Chinese guys that had the cannabis in, uh, that I mentioned there, the Indo-Europeans. And there's a kind of a yin-yang relationship with cannabis in China um, because one's very relaxing, one's very stimulating, you know. And they share, uh, kind of share a name. Uh, one uh, is Ma Hua and the other one is Hua Ma. And uh, um, the reversals of the name because of, the, of the, their similarity. And um, in China, can, at this time period, um, and Taoists were also picking up the spiritual use of cannabis around the same time. And we're talking about 500, 600 BC. And it's appearing in Taoist writings as a plant of mortality, an elixir of immortality. And that's what Soma is, an elixir of immortality. Mortality. Um, and uh, um, it is believed, I said, this, that the Chinese term uh, was somehow picked up by the Scythians, Huma. And when it came into the Bactria Margiana archaeological complex, it came in as Huma. And so this eventually became Heoma. And then through further linguistic changes, uh, became Soma in the Vedic region. We know that uh, cannabis was largely imported into India at first during the early period of uh, early Vedic period, because there's lots of references to this and how it was taxed and stuff like that. And we also know from the archaeological record and uh, samples of soil that can cannabis was not indigenous to this region of India, right? Um, so the idea is, is that uh, Huma became placed on uh, this cannabis beverage as the ephedra and the cannabis came down from the, the, the Tocharian Jushi Jushi into China, into the Bactria Margiana ar archaeological complex. And then this, as it further went into India, it became Soma. And there's a, there's a lot more evidence for this than what I can explain here. Obviously, it takes huge, huge amounts of space to go over it. But if you take a look at even... Uh, the, the disappearance of Soma, it's completely wound up to uh, uh, access to this uh, Chinese cannabis being cut off and took a while for the indigenous uh, uh, Indian uh, uh, industry to pick up on cannabis growing and producing and stuff like that. And so it kind of fell into the background for a while. So what is the origin from your research? The pre-Indian origin? Well, the Indian origin well, originates oh, the with these... Pre-Indian. I'm sorry? The pre-Indian, like, well, who were you? Yeah, that these would be with Indo-Europeans in China who were using cannabis ritually, uh, Scythians who were drinking it as well, and uh, um, the adoption of the name Huma to cannabis becoming Heoma. So it's merely cannabis has been in use by Indo-Europeans for a long time. What happens is this new term comes into play, and that kind of spreads into, and as it spreads into those regions. It's adopted this Chinese name, Huma, which means fire cannabis or Scythian cannabis, and uh, refers specifically to these more psychoactive strains of cannabis. And so it's the adoption of this name into the Vedic religion, but the use of cannabis for spiritual purposes is much, much older than uh, either the Vedic or Avestan religion and goes back to like 5,500 years ago for funerary purposes. So the Sitchin, the, these guys were Europeans. Yeah, they were like, uh, they're kind of like a mixed race, you know, like uh, Eurasian, I guess, would be the would be the better term. Like, it, it's such a broad term for so many groups in the in the Persian region. They're called Saka in the northern region. They're called Scythian, but they're all kind of share some cultural uh, uh, um, connections of language and mythology and that type of thing. But they're, you know, they're really like this. This term Scythian is like this blanket term for just groups of Indo-European tribes that it would be very uh, hard to talk about because uh, there's just so many different names involved and groups and time periods uh, that uh, we just use this blanket term Scythian. It's kind of like the term Gnosticism mm -hmm. to describe all the competing groups of Christianity in the first few centuries AD. They're all labeled Gnostic now. None of them would have known themselves by name Gnostic, they would be the Nicolosians, the Ophites, uh, 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 whatever, but we refer to them as Gnostic uh, uh, and this collective name. Same thing with the Scythians. There's just loads of different tribes uh, um, uh, that, 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 that are, are, are designated Scythian now. 
Well, we'll get to Gnostic in a second. I just uh, wanted to ask you about the Bon tradition, the pre-Buddhist Tibet. Yeah. The, this was shamanic tradition from my research. And, Absolutely, uh, yeah. Buddhists came and just eradicated them and, you know, built their temples. And that's it. They just conquered, basically. Yeah. Place, you know, it's from your research, what do you think they were using? I haven't really looked at, like... Um, the Bon religion myself, you know, um, enough to really comment on the pre-Buddhist situation. In Buddhism, you know, like from about third, fourth century, I think, AD, there's a text that refers to a uh, Buddha subsisting on one hemp seed a day under the Bodhi tree before announcing his di divine revelations, right? Um, but uh, I would say Buddhism and its origins, this has a lot to do with the disappearance of Soma. Buddhism was a huge influence on India, even outside of like religious beliefs in the, in the sense that, you know, vegetarianism, uh, the bans on alcohol, all that stuff came in through Buddhism. The, that, those things were allowed in the Vedic religion. And Buddhism was a real reaction to the Vedic religion. Vedism was controlling all aspects of people's lives. If you wanted to get married, uh, you'd have to hire a Vedic priest and pay a bunch of money. If you wanted to hold a Soma ritual, you'd have to pay taxes to the Soma guy, bringing in the Soma to the priest, officiating the ritual, all this types of stuff. And everything you did, had a child, you know, built a house, all these things required certain rituals. And it was all very complicated. And, and Buddhism did away with all that type of stuff, right? You know, came down to much more simpler religion. And it also did away with a lot of ecstatic practices. It's much more of a sober kind of uh, uh, contemplative type of thing, right? And that's, uh, um, according to some of, of the authors on the subject, is where we start to see the prohibition and disappearance of Soma, is with the arrival of Buddhism. And it's not until uh, uh, the resurgence of Hinduism, centuries later, that we start to see this kind of cannabis use come back ritually uh, with followers of Shiva and stuff like that. They were probably always there in the background, but India was predominantly Buddhist for centuries. Uh, um, there's a, a large period of, uh, of time there where it's predominantly Buddhist, right? Um, and um, in Buddhism later, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, 10th century, 9th century, 11th century, um, we start to see cannabis appearing in Buddhist texts like the Tara Tantra, uh, the uh, uh, Mahakala Tantra and other texts. And it's clearly being used for, you know, yogic purposes there uh, for, you know, the sort of shamanic practices we might have expected in Taoism, where it's kind of like an astral traveling type of situation, but also as it was used in by the Sufis and stuff to blow away the ego, to get to uh, a, a place of unity where there's no duality. Right. And that's a big, a big draw. I think, you know, both in Hinduism with uh, sadhus that use cannabis and in uh, Islam with Sufis that use cannabis, a goal was to obliterate the ego, ego death, and get down to that core of, of a energy that is pulsating life out from us beyond the realm of thought, you know? And that's kind of what the goal, that's what the goal of yoga is all around, right? That's why, that's why there's such an intimate connection between cannabis and yoga. It's because yoga is to like make your body still enough so it's not distracting you with aches and pains and uncomfort so that you can sit there and totally lose yourself, your ego, undo your personality and get down to that common core, that essence that is the essence of God that's inside of us all behind us. So when do you think the so when do you think the soma disappeared from like being practiced in India? Well, it had to do, as I said, with the rise of Buddhism and this uh, uh, suppression of uh, of um, uh, uh, of these ecstatic practices for a more contemplative and sober type of uh, worldview, right? Um, but also uh, um, access to the quality cannabis that was coming out of. Uh, uh, out of China, uh, Chinese Turkmenistan, and uh, uh, following these trade routes through the Asian world. And it wasn't only um, making its way into India. You know, we have uh, recently, last year, uh, they announced um, uh, 8th century BC evidence of cannabis resins being burnt in a, uh, in a temple in Jerusalem. 
And uh, this was, you know, is very fascinating. This is all part of the same trade network, right? Uh, and uh, this time it's traveling with the Indo-European name for cannabis, Kana. And that's the root word for all of our cannabis terms, Chambra, Hanf, all these different European terms is this root word, Kana. And, these, and the Scythians also went into the Mideast. In fact, there was a, a city in Israel, Scythopolis, in ancient Israel, because of uh, uh, they were so well known in the region. And uh, cannabis came into Israel and fueled the religion of the Bible. I mentioned it, that in 8th century uh, uh, BCE, there's evidence of a temple in Arad, Jerusalem, where cannabis was burnt on an altar and this was used to talk to Yahweh. Uh, um, and this is very interesting because I'd been suggesting that cannabis had been used uh, by the ancient Hebrew for like 25, 30 years before this discovery, based on the research of the etymologist and anthropologist Sula Bennett, who writing in the 1930s uh, um, suggested there was a Hebrew term, cannabosum that uh, appears in Exodus, Ezekiel, Isaiah, Song of Songs, and Jeremiah, that was actually a reference to cannabis. And this is a fascinating uh, proposition because uh, in the first of these references, Exodus 30, 23, God, who first appears to Moses in flames of fire from within a burning bush, commands Moses to make this holy anointing oil with about six pounds of cannabis mixed with myrrh and cinnamon and cassia into about a gallon and gallon and a half of olive oil. Uh, um, and uh, every time Moses is to speak to the Lord, he's to place some of this oil on his skin and THC is fatty soluble and can actually pass through the skin. Oils are very good uh, means of, of transferring this. And he also takes some of this oil and he places it on the altar of incense with what is referred to as the tent of the meeting. This is a very small enclosed area inside the bigger temple and then he talks to the Lord, in fact, in the pillar of smoke over the altar of incense. And so when you throw cannabis into this scenario, this is, becomes very controversial. Sula Bennett said that when the Hebrew texts were translated into the Greek about 300 BC, a mistranslation took place. And this Hebrew term, cannabosum, was mistranslated as calamus. And this mistranslation followed through to the modern Bibles, but the original term here was cannabis. And this evidence out of Arad, Jerusalem, seems to confirm this theory. Um, and so this is pretty radical stuff because um, uh, I think Terence McKenna, the great uh, entheogen uh, pioneer, I think one of his greatest contributions to this field of research was uh, bringing in Julian Jaynes theory of the origins of consciousness that he put forth uh, in his book, uh, The Origins of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicamarial Mind. And Jaynes' theory was that agent man didn't think in the same way that we do. Thinking was an evolutionary development that took place. But the first people that experienced the ability to think experienced it much like a schizophrenic does. There's a voice coming from without, outside, outside of themselves. They'd hear the voice of their chief or the voice of their father. And this would kick in at times of upheaval and stress. Prior to that, people were just so uh, uh, um, consumed with survival that they didn't really have time for a lot of reflective thinking. We're more like animals. You know, speaking that operates actually in a very different area of the brain than thinking. And many animals have kind of language-like capabilities, uh, signals and sounds that, that mean things to each other, right? You know, and consciousness kind of develops out of this. And so uh, in James's theory, this could kick in at times of stress of upheaval or maybe uh, sickness when you have a fever. Uh, McKenna added to this with the idea that you could create a fire in the brain by ingesting psychoactive substances. And when we take a look at Moses' situation, he goes inside the tent of the meeting and he burns cannabis. And this is very similar to how the Scythians did it as well, right? A tent, uh, a brazier, cannabis thrown in the brazier and inhale the fumes, right? This is just a, a, a little slightly more advanced version of that same sort of thing. And so he goes into the tent and he burns the cannabis and he stares into the smoke and he says, Lord, what we, should we do? And then finally a voice reaches back out of the smoke and says, Moses, this is what you must do. Tell the people of Israel this. And he gives them the answer. And Moses is outside of the tent and says, this is what the Lord says we must do. 
And none of the other Israelites in the story ever see God. They only see Moses inside the tent and smoke pouring out of the tent, right? Uh, um, and so this is like classic shamanism. And uh, um, it's a real threat to fundamental religion. I would say it's on par uh, when fully understood with Darwin's theory of evolution in comparison to the story of Adam and Eve in the myths of Genesis, because what we re is revealed here is the plant-based shamanic origins of religion itself, which is very ironic when you consider how these Abrahamic religions dealt with shamanic practices when they came into contact with them, like, you know, particularly uh, later Christianity when it came into the new world and it witnessed things like peyote ingestion, mushroom ingestion. Uh, this was all deemed witchcraft, witchcraft and demonic behavior. These were the devil's sacraments, not, not to be had. But then when we take a look back to the origins of their religion, we find the same sort of practice. And this is radical information. This is a paradigm shift that is happening, I think, through archaeology and the study of the historical record. And it's what humanity reads, needs right now. This is the medicine we need, man. I completely agree with you. I speak about this out loud. I write this in my books. I came to this same realization through my medicines and it, it it's like a it, it's like a main theme of my you know of, of my writing that all religions basically have uh, roots uh, in intelligence you know it's it's all intergenic religions yeah. that, that happens before and then it just got uh, controlled uh, because um, you know it's all well, it doesn't control. require an intercessor, you know, like uh, the big thing about religion, like Christianity is like we hold the keys to heaven. Yeah. You have to come to us and we tell you what what why it is that this is true. It's not about self-experience. This was a big difference between uh, Gnosticism. Gnosticism was about knowledge. and You had to have your own experience of self-knowledge as a Gnostic. It wasn't something you were taught, man. It was something you experienced, whereas modern Christianity, which is really the church of Paul, not the church of Jesus. It should be called Paulianity because it's his stamp. It's his version mm -hmm. of Christianity. He was persecuting Christians. He talks about, it. you know, that's what the whole story is. He's like persecuting Christians, having them sent off to death. And then uh, uh, he allegedly had a vision on the road to Damascus that blinded him. He likely had taken sacraments he'd seized from Gnostics and had a vision and his own distorted worldview uh, was projected out that because, you know, all, knowledge and, and, and these experiences isn't always light and pretty. Psychedelics and entheogenic substances can go to some very dark places in the wrong hands. Take a look at the Manson family, for instance, right, you know, and uh, um, th 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 and not all not all shaman in the, in the jungle are good people either, right? You know what I mean? These are tools. You can use a hammer to build a house or you can use it to smash somebody's head in. Same sort of thing with entheogenic substances, man. And they should always, you know, anybody that that gets into these, the biggest rule is self-governance, man. This is you and your body and you're in charge. Nobody else. You need to make your own decisions and you need to base your own decisions on your own knowledge. And that means like doing some research before you, you start following this path and taking it pretty seriously. Uh, because you can't always trust people, man. That's one of the things you learn in life. So what do you think was the burning bush? That I think that's like likely an allegorical symbol, you know, for the cannabis that was being used myself. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, a lot of, there's some competing theories like uh, 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 Professor Benny Shannon, he suggests that uh, acacia uh, was used because uh, acacia is, can have DMT, DMT in it, yeah. acacia bark, and this was somehow uh, uh, mixed with Syrian root. And acacia is mentioned in the Bible. But it's a hardwood, and it was a very well-known hardwood. Uh, my view is that it was a hardwood. I don't think the evidence is there to show a preparation was made based solely on references to hardwood. Other people have pointed to um, mushroom use, and it's like I, I, I don't want to be say you know give the impression that I don't respect these substances that I'm talking about. I, they're absolutely, you can have very, very powerful experiences, uh, spiritual experiences on DMT containing substances. There's no doubt about that. Uh, likewise with mushrooms, you can have very, very powerful spiritual experience with mushrooms. 
the, the, the you know South America, North American history is proof of that. Uh, but I think uh, you know, like to suggest like something like the manna in the Bible was psychoactive mushrooms based on the passage given is I, I just not convinced. You know, it's probably something more like lichen or something like that. Uh, um, it's, there's n- not not strong enough evidence, and that was what I was saying. What I liked about cannabis research is there's like so much historical data on it. You know what I mean? And now we have the archaeological evidence from from the Holy Land uh, regarding its use there, right? Um, I don't doubt that you know other substances were used. Mandrake was certainly known to the ancient Hebrews, and I can't see how they would miss opium with its prevalence of use throughout the the ancient Near East. You know. Um, but uh, I think, you know, there's a tendency with some modern researchers, and oh, I've written about this, I've written critical reviews, I just wrote one of uh, uh, Professor Jerry Brown's The Psychedelic Gospels, I've written a critical review of Mike Crowley's The Secret Drugs of Buddhism, I've written a critical review of R. Gordon Wasson's theory on Soma and the Fly Agaric, and I've written a critical review of Flattery and Schwartz's theory about uh, Syrian Rue, Haoma and Harmaline as well. And, you know, and I've discussed uh, the points where I, I think that these things fall apart. Um, I haven't really got a lot of response from these other authors on it. They're not too happy with me, but uh, I, I feel that they should be at least addressing the criticisms that are being put forth if they want to hold on to their theories. And in regards to cannabis and soma, you know, that, that is gaining in, in prominence over the fly agaric theory you're starting to see this on books on persian history they're siding with cannabis and uh, a fedra mix for haoma and other texts as well uh, many well-known indologists like uh, elaine danilo uh, um, dl basham are pointing to cannabis as a, as a source of soma so uh, um it is kind of happening among scholarly circles but not so much uh, that I, I find that the in the entheogenic and psychedelic community, some things are just kind of become entrenched and it's hard for these researchers to shake this off. And a lot of people are building on these shaky foundations, in my opinion. And so I, I, I think that uh, some real critical thinking is, is not being applied in, in, in the areas of uh, entheological and psych- psychedelic research. I, I respect uh, some researchers like Tom Hatzis is a very good solid researcher and there's other ones. Mike Jay is a very good solid researcher. Well, there's a lot of loose research out there in my opinion. So maybe we can talk about Gnosticism a little bit and uh, how, you know, the confrontation they had with the with the later, you know, with the charge, basically. and Yeah, yeah. And, well, and I mentioned, they, like, mm-hmm. uh, um, Moses' holy anointing oil, right? And this was something that played. It was also used as an incense and drank in the Old Testament period, mixed with wine. There's uh, uh, references to cannabis-infused wines and stuff. One of the biggest... Now, the, term, the name itself, Christ, is actually the Greek translation of a Hebrew term, Messiah. And it makes direct reference to this anointing oil that was described in Exodus 30, 23, that contained cannabis. And um, in the Bible, Jesus baptizes no one. But in the oldest of the synoptic gospels, Mark, he sends out the 12 apostles with anointing oil to heal the sick and cast out demons. Casting out demons in these days may well have meant uh, um, treating somebody for epilepsy because it was thought to be demonic possession up until the medieval time. And we have references in Assyrian text to Kanabu, which is the Assyrian name for cannabis, uh, ointments being used for hand of ghosts, which is thought to have been a reference to epilepsy. And uh, we see later again, I mentioned Paracelsus earlier in the 16th century, uh, applying a cannabis topical preparation for epilepsy, similar to this suggestion here we're talking for Jesus. And even in the, the New Testament text, um, they say those who have received the anointing oil require no teacher. Uh, um, because they have been anointed. And uh, one of the main points of contention noted by Gnostic scholars, such as Kurt Rudolph, between Gnostic sects and what became the Catholic Church, was over water baptism versus anointing with oil. And in the Gnostic texts recovered from the Nag Hammadi Library texts, uh, uh, discovered in 1945, which is a, a cache of Gnostic texts thought to be from the 3rd or 4th century AD, hidden from the hands of the Catholic Church who was out to destroy them. 
it refers specifically how there was only water in the baptism, but there's fire in the anointing oil. And through the anointing oil, we're initiated to unfading bliss. And through the anointing oil, we become Christ because we have received the chrism. And they refer to it for medical purposes as well, such as straightening the crooked limbs. And in another Gnostic text, it refers to Jesus giving the apostles a box full of medicine and unguents because he says you have to heal the body first before you can heal the soul. Um, so there's a lot of indications there that these earlier practices had continued on to some extent. And uh, in later texts, such as, such as the uh, Book of Jew from the Bruce, uh, Bruce Codex, a fourth century Gnostic text, it gets very entheogenic. Uh, um, the, they, they are burning an incense that contains a wonder. And then the, Jesus is uh, taking vines and putting them into wine bottles with wine and, you know, like leaving that, them to soak. And uh, uh, putting uh, a plant that has a name, I forget what name it's used, but these uh, uh, it, it's a, uh, oh, I, I've forgotten the name of it, but it's a plant that was known in Greek texts as well because uh, it was used for prophesizing and stuff like that. And Jesus takes that same plant and puts it in the mouth of the apostles. Now that could be a reference to something like mushrooms. We just don't know what it is. It's a plant. It was uh, associated by the Greeks with the mysteries of Osiris. Um, and uh, put into the mouths of apostles, and, as well as their inhaling smoke and drinking infused wines and burning and eating other plants. It's all very entheogenic, as well as uh, another reference to infused wines in the uh, account of a Gnostic teacher, Mark. And this is written by the Catholic fathers condemning no, no, Gnosticism. Ignatius, I think, is, uh, Arrhenius write, writes about this in the third century, and he's talking about infused wines that impart the power of grace this goddess on those who ingest it uh, um so clearly gnosticism is very very entheogenic and uh, gnostic scholars are starting to embrace this idea now uh, other first you know 25 years ago 20 years ago when, when i was writing about this this was almost unheard of in gnostic uh, uh scholarship but gnostic scholarships are starting to recognize uh, references like the account of Mark by Irenaeus and uh, the Bruce Codex as clear use of psychoactive substances in the early Christian period. You know, I read the Nag Hammadi. Well, not the whole thing. I have the book here. And I found it a difficult text to go through. You know, it's it's kind of incomplete. It's 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 abrupted. It's like... No yeah, yeah, well, land, not, you not fragmented. Know? Yeah, you kind of have to read, like, to kind of get... For one thing... Those texts, they're not from like one group of Gnostics. I mentioned that it's a blanket term, Gnosticism. There's all sorts of different beliefs in Gnosticism. There's some prevailing themes like the biblical God, Yahweh, was actually the demon. And uh, the serpent was actually the good guy. That's a pretty prevailing theme in Gnosticism. But not all Gnostic sects believe that even, you know. Uh, um, and so it's kind of confusing because there's probably texts in there that are written by different groups that had different beliefs. A lot of these texts were produced by Gnostics based on their own experiences. But I think what you kind of need to do to really kind of get a, a gist of the whole thing is you got to read what the church fathers said about the Gnostics, but keep in mind they're condemning them. They're their enemies, right? And so not everything can be taken uh, as valid. Some of it's just propaganda against their enemies, and some of it's, you know, they don't know. They're just guessing or making shit up based on what they know. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, uh, also there's some Gnostic, Gnostic texts that survived uh, uh, that were not in the Nagamati library, like the Pistis Sophia and the Bruce Codex and, uh, and other texts. And so those are important to be aware of, 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 of the Nagamati texts, right? Um, and, but the Nagamati texts themselves, these were like uh, hidden in a cave and they're fragments, you know, so you could have a text that's missing half the page or parts of the page where stuff's worn out. And so there's a sentence and half the sentence is missing and then it picks up again. And so there's, that's another challenge is what's, what are those missing words saying, you know, and so mm -hmm. something if we can only kind of guess at what, what fill in the blanks as best we can. Um, uh, but in many ways, my view is, is the discovery of the Nag Hammadi texts with things like the, the, the Gospel of Thomas, thought to be a collection of actual sayings from Jesus, 
is in fact the resurrection of Jesus that everybody's waiting for. The Gnostic Jesus is the resurrection because, you know, in the Bible, Jesus refers to the secrets and mysteries. And he says it's not he can only reveal these in parables. He can't talk about these directly. And then we find this cache of documents where Jesus is talking directly about these same mysteries. And so, it, you know, in a very different Jesus than the Jesus depicted in the New Testament, a laughing Jesus, a Jesus with a sense of humor, uh, uh, you know, a loving Jesus, a Jesus that kisses Mary. Uh, um, and uh, uh, all these things, you know, and it's a radical re-envisioning of Jesus. And I, I, I'm saying that this is the resurrection of the literary Jesus. A Jesus that eats cannabis too, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Jesus that heals with cannabis, you know. So, and uh, we take a look at even the miracles in the New Testament, the, the healing of the, the blind man with the clay poultice on his eyes, the healing of the menstruating woman, the, the demon-possessed child. These are all types of ailments that cannabis has been used for. Cannabis is very effective for, for glaucoma. It's very effective for epilepsy. It's been used as a, a for, for, for menstruating problems. You know, it was the, a patented medicine for for, for such diseases in, uh, prior to prohibition. Um, and so, you know, this is there, there, there may be some sort of connection that we can show here uh, through science and history. And, you know, I should point out that Arad Jerusalem is not the only archaeological discovery of cannabis in the Holy Land from 4th century AD, which is in this Gnostic period that we're talking about in Bet Shemesh, Israel. They found a tome of a young woman who died during childbirth and cannabis had been used topically and as an incense in that tome on that woman. So we know that it was used in exactly these ways that I'm referring to here. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was used that way in that area, in that time period. Uh, would you, do you know, like if I want to go through Nahamadi and without going through the whole thing, do you remember a part where Jesus speak directly and what we just talking about is like, where would they go? Any reference? Do you remember? Well, I think the Bruce Codex is, is really specific. I have an article uh, is the most specific one regarding Jesus, you know? Um, and there's also, I, I don't know. I can't remember. There's so many like texts uh, uh, um, in there, but there's also this one where he gives them the undulant box. I could tell you just a second here. I just give mm -hmm. me one second sure, and I'll, sure. I'll tell you. Is this uh, part of Nag Hammadi? Yeah, this is part of the uh, uh, Nag Hammadi. Um, just give me one second, and I'll give you some text names here. Uh, and uh, okay, in the Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles, uh, demonstrates Jesus' own view of the importance of this rite when he gives the disciples an quote unguent box and quote a pouch full of medicine with instructions to go into the city of habitation and heal the sick. He tells them, you must heal the bodies first before you can heal the heart. So, you know, in, in, the, in, in the Acts of Peter and the Twelve Apostles, uh, um, he's referring specifically to a pouch full of medicine and a box of unguents. And in the Acts of Thomas, he says, you are the plant of kindness. Let your power come and heal by this unction. The Acts of Thomas also refers to Indian leaves, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, th th that's one there. And then um, in the uh, um, in the Bruce Codex, uh, um, I was going to get, get you this reference here early. In the Bruce Codex, it's, it's much more uh, familiar, you know, um, and uh, there, uh, in the second book of Ayu, which is believed to have been originally written down uh, on a papyrus sometime of the first and third century AD, uh, um, it records Jesus with, tw with his 12 male disciples, along with some women disciples, to join him so he can reveal the, the treasury of light. And in that text, they burn an incense, which I referred to, which contained a wonder. And uh, this is the one where they put uh, uh, the, the plants in the mouths and all that type of stuff. So, you know, th these are pretty clear references, right? Um, and then there's also this Irenaeus account where they're drinking infused wines, right? 
So those are some pretty clear accounts. There's other texts in the Gnostic uh, uh, corpus like Zosimos, which is thought to have been influenced by Zoroastrian things. And in Zosimos, he describes his visionary experience and he, he, just, he says he drank something. And then at the end of the text, which is very fragmented, unfortunately, he said, I did not take it again. <laughs> he must have been probably too freaked out from, yeah. from the powerful experience. And I should point out that, you know, we can't compare our casual cannabis smoking to a lot of these entheogenic accounts of cannabis in the ancient world. When they were doing things like in infusions of cannabis into wine, for instance, these were very powerful infusions. They'd knock you right out. You could be knocked out, according to Zoroastrian accounts, for a day or two. How cold? Uh, I mean, you know, it's important to remember that cannabis was, in fact, one of the first anesthetics. By it, around 50 AD in China, they were using cannabis-infused wines to perform complicated operations on people. And uh, this is another historical fact, you know what I mean? So this stuff, not only do you have a visionary experience, an out-of-body experience, it's powerful enough to knock you out that, so that you could have an operation. And um, such powerful entheogenic experiences, this likely gave rise, this was Marseille Eliad's belief, this gave rise to the concept of a soul. It was when people were like dosing themselves with these types of substances and then having these visions and then waking up and they're like, well, we saw your body there the whole time, though. And he was like, but I went to heaven and I saw all this stuff, you know. And they're like, yeah, but you were here. Well, how do you explain that? Some part of me must have left my body and gone off. And this gives the idea of a soul that can separate from the body. That was Eliad's belief. Hmm. Well, it uh, makes sense, you know, for anyone who works with uh, antigens and plant medicine. Do you think Jesus learned the art of healing in Egypt from the priests when he left? I mean, we know that he was absent for like 30, 33 years before he returned. And he was. In uh, yeah, we don't know where Jesus was. Uh, uh, you know, like it's like all speculative. You know what I mean? Some people don't even believe there was a historical Jesus. And um, uh, um, that. Uh, that is, is, is where the lost years are. Um, so, yeah. Unfortunately, that's about all the time I can give you this morning. I've got to go uh, uh, take care of, uh, of a bit of business, but I'm happy to talk again sometime. Sure. Yeah, that's very good. We can, we can uh, pick up uh, from here next time we talk because it's, there is more, much more to discuss. <laughs> you know? Okay. Sounds good. Very, uh, thank you very much for uh, your time and I uh, enjoy our conversation and sure, let's meet again. Okay, sounds good, brother. Take thank care. Thank you very much.